Uh, would you ask Mr. Metcalf to come back in, please? All right, Mr. Metcalf, ready yeah. to carry on? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Metcalf. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Metcalf, before we continue, can I take you back to something you said this morning on the transcript, please, at page 70? If you could be showing page 70 of the raw transcript. Uh, uh, and you say uh, at, uh, well, at lines one and following, I'm, we're halfway through a question from me about the text of the 2nd of July 2014 meeting uh, and the reason behind, quotes at line two, why building control officers were permitting the use of class naught materials above 18 metres was because of the LABC approval for K15. That was a question. Answer, that had been suggested to me. Question, by whom? Answer, I believe Chris Macy. Question, Wintech. Answer, highlighted that to me, yes. Uh, now, can I ask you please to be shown WIN705. This is the first page of Chris Macy's statement to the inquiry of the 3rd of November 2021. Can we please go to page 25 in that document, paragraph 73, under the heading, the LABC system type approval, straight registered detail certificate for K15. 73 says, the inquiry has asked me a series of questions regarding these LABC certificates. I was not aware of these certificates and therefore did not have any concerns or views about their content. I did not discuss these certificates with any of my colleagues. I do not know whether any of my colleagues at Wintech were aware of them. Now, that's um, Chris Macy's recollection in his witness statement to the inquiry. Bearing that in mind, would you like to reconsider uh, your recollection, the accuracy of your recollection that you told us this morning that, that it was Chris Macy who had brought the LABC uh, um, statement in its system type approval to your attention that I've shown you. No, I don't. That, that, that was my recollection. Can I then move on to the presentation that took place on the 7th of October 2014 this is a presentation given by Alan Keeler to CWCT members on that date. CWCT 5026, please. There's the first page. Uh, and just looking at that document, do you remember who drafted this? Was it Alan Keeler or did you have any input into it? It would have been put together by Alan Keeler. We, we would have discussed it, but Alan would have put the, uh, put the presentation together. I follow. Now, let's look at page four, please. Slide four. Two boxes at the bottom of the page. You can see that. Green box, uh, which is a question. Does building contain a floor more than 18 metres above ground? Yes. You see that? Yes. And then you move to the, to the move box. Uh, on the right, materials to be limited combustibility, Euro class A2, external surface above 18 metres to be class B. You see that? Yes. Now, is the MOVE box a reference to 12.7 for insulation and diagram 40 for external surfaces? Yes. Right. Let's go then to slide 13, page 13. Combustibility of materials. And that says, I'll read all three bullet points. Intention of clause 12.7 was to require all significant materials in facade to be of limited combustibility. Extensive fires have occurred around the world where combustible cladding, notably polyethylene cord ACM, has been used. CWCT and BRE are in process of obtaining clarification through FAQ's section of building regulations website. Now, how had CWCT come to understand that the intention of Clause 12.7 was to require all significant materials in facade to be of limited combustibility. So th this follows the, the discussion we, that we had at our meeting on the 2nd of July. Well, uh, at that meeting, as you've told us this morning, uh, it, it was Sarah Colwell who came up with that. Yes. A, a, if I can put it this way, against the run of play. Yes. Yes, and, and that remained the position at the, at the end of the meeting in the sense that she didn't persuade everybody that, that that interpretation was correct and everybody left the meeting thinking that that, that was so. 
we didn't have any issues with that being what clause 12.7 was meant to say. If, if, if clause 12.7 was, was intended to say that all significant materials should be of limited combustibility, we didn't have a problem with that. Our issue was that's not what it actually said in our, our, our interpretation of that clause. So then can we please have, or keep this slide on the screen, but let's have 12 point, I'm sorry, slide four next to it. You, know, you have this slide 13 on the left-hand side, if we can get it there, and slide four on the right. And let's compare the two. Now, looking at the two and looking at the um, bottom two boxes on the right-hand side, the greenish box and the mauve box, how were those two boxes consistent with the first bullet point on the left? That's, as far as we were concerned, that, that's the whole dilemma. That's, that's the, the difficulty that, that <coughs> we get into with being, being, in, in being told that clause 12.7 applies to everything, that seems to contradict what was in 12.6, and that's what's highlighted there. Oh, I see. Okay, so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm a bit puzzled about one aspect of this. As I understand it, you had the meeting early in July, at which, for the first time, uh, the notion that Clause 12.7 was intended to uh, require all significant materials to be of limited combustibility was raised for the first time, as far as you were concerned. Yes. And Sarah Colwell was the one who raised it. Yes. There was discussion. She does not appear to have been in the majority, and the matter was left on the basis that she would contact Brian Martin. Yes. Now, by October, Mr Keeler is putting forward in this uh, presentation that the intention of Clause 12.7 was to require limited combustibility all through. Yes. Did his understanding change, and if so, why? No, I, I don't think our understanding did change. We assumed, as I said before, that the FAQ would be published and would clarify. Right, we're, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. I, I thought you told me that at, that at the meeting early in July, you heard for the first time the suggestion that limited combustibility applied to everything. Yes. So you can't have thought that there was an intention that it should do that, I assume, before that meeting. Correct. And presumably, since you probably spoke to Mr Keeler quite often, you had no reason to think that he thought that was the intention before the meeting. Is that right? Correct. Right. Now, um, I don't know whether Sarah Colwell was able to persuade you that she knew what the intention was behind the draft or behind the, the words. Did she, did she sort of speak with an authoritative view about that that you were, could accept? We, a, a logical explanation wasn't really given, Quite. but considering Sarah Colwell's expertise and BRE's relationship with MHCLG in terms of fire research and guidance, the fact that she said it, 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 it held, it, no, it was, that was, she was an important person as far as this was concerned. So if she was saying that, we couldn't just ignore it. We, our argument was that what was written didn't hmm. tie in with that. As I, as I just said, we had no issue, if that was the intention, we had no issue hmm. with that being the intention. And the idea of, behind um, <coughs> Alan Keeler's presentation to our members was to kind of inform people that this debate was going on, this is the this is what we're currently being told. We hope this will be clarified by an FAQ as, as noted in the final point. Right. Well, I was just puzzled by the fact that you seem to have adopted the view that that was the intention of 12.7. Um, and I wasn't quite sure why you'd adopted that view. I, I, don't, I can't recall exactly what Alan Keeler said when he put this slide up. It could well have been we have been informed that the intention of Clause 12.7 was to include all significant materials. We are trying to clarify that by means of an FAQ. All right. I, I, I don't think our position had, had changed, but you know, we weren't against that position, and, and this was an opportunity to inform our members of, of this change. 
Right. Thank you very much. Just, just building on that a little bit, um, coming to October 2014, this was a presentation document, so it was, it was presented, presumably, it was spoken to. Yes. Who spoke to it? Alan Keeler. To whom? To uh, people who attended our AGM and members meeting that particular year. R right. Now, were you there? Yes. You were. Do you remember how these two slides were presented together? Uh, more specifically, do you remember whether Alan Keeler told the meeting uh, that although, looking at the left-hand side, first bullet, the intention of Clause 12.7 was to require all significant materials in facade to be of limited combustibility, looking at the right-hand side, there's an, an, an anomaly because Diagram 40 requires the external surface above 18 metres only to be Class B. I don't recall exactly how Alan handled that. So the, the intention of, of this presentation was to inform the members of what we were doing in this area, the discussions that we had, that, that, that had taken place, and, and update people on, on the, the new requirements. I mean, do you remember that whether anybody at the meeting asked the question, well, hold on a minute. At slide four, you told us that external surfaces only needed to be class B above 18 metres, but here you are telling us that the intention was that all significant materials in the facade should be of limited combustibility. How do you square the two? Did anybody ask that question at the meeting? Not that I recall. Right. And was the intention, was your CWCT's intention to spell out the fact that there was this anomaly or would be if the intention was, um, was, was the case, uh, or, or, or not? I don't know exactly what Alan said during that presentation, right. I'm afraid. I think the, 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 the slide on the right-hand side of the screen, the, the idea behind this came from our meeting in, in July 2014, and, and the idea put to us that we should have a simple kind of flow chart going through the various different uh, performance requirements for the external wall and, and giving guidance on, on what the different uh, materials and components needed to do. And as written in approved document B, you, we do end up with this, this anomaly, as, as you put it. What you, yeah, yes, but my question is that really this. When this slideshow was being put together, was the purpose to identify the anomaly and, and uh, invite, invite discussion about it? Or did nobody spot the fact that, clause, um, that slide four uh, at the bottom where I've shown you was actually inconsistent with the first bullet point in slide 13? I, I don't know. You don't know? No. Um, looking at the first bullet point and second bullet point uh, on the left-hand side, slide 13, that's a different view, isn't it, to the view that you had expressed in the August uh, of 2014 about the compliance of the career panels? Yes. We, we were asked by Stuart Taylor of Wintec on the, I think it was the 7th of July, so very soon after the meeting that we'd had on the 2nd of July where we, uh, this was raised for the first time. And as I said before, at that point, we were still, we were still uncertain as to exactly where we were going with this. Well, I think you say you were uncertain. Uh, in fact, you were saying that the current view was not the Colwell view. In other words, uh, external surfaces above 18 metres only needed to be Class B. That was the the view. Yeah. That was our view of the industry interpretation of that clause. Yes. R right. Um, did, uh, the, did CWTT start telling its members and anybody who asked that, to quote the left-hand bullet point, it, the intention of Clause 7 was to require all significant materials in the facade to be of limited combustibility? We did do that, yes. When did you start doing that? I, I suspect that this was the first time that we did it in public, if, if that's the right term to use, um, at our AGM. We then incorporated that requirement into subsequent um, presentations within within courses and if, if asked that's the view we would have given right w when did you change your mind 
from the current view, as expressed in the career email run we saw? Over the summer of 2014, I suppose. What made you change your mind? We were not opposed to the view that Sarah Colwell was putting forward. We assumed that an FAQ would be published quickly that would confirm, officially confirm that view, and therefore we were, we were happy to, to put that interpretation forward because we assumed it would be clarified. You say to confirm that view. In answer to a question from the chairman a moment or two ago, you said that the basis of her authority was, was uh, BRE's relationship with MHCLG. What did you know of that? BRE used to be government-owned, and, and my understanding was that they, they still had a, a good relationship with government in terms of guidance and advice and testing when it came to, to fire performance. What led you to think that Sarah Colwell spoke with any degree of authority and knowledge about what the original intention of government had been as a fact back in 2005 to six, when the word filler material, etc., was inserted into 12.7? I assumed, rightly or wrongly, that BRE had been involved in, in the drafting of the new version of, a, of the 2006 version of approved document B. I don't know if that's correct or not. I assume that was the case. And was it for that reason that you thought not only that she spoke with authority at the meeting, but that you assumed that the FAQ would clarify the meaning of 12.7 consistently with what she was telling you? Yes. And therefore consistently with that first bullet point? Yes. I see. Um, you see the words all significant materials in your first bullet point there. What was meant by that? In probably in very simple terms, we would be talking about the, the cladding, the insulation, uh, support rails and brackets, the sheathing board, perhaps m membranes and, and, and those sorts of materials. Right. Did that apply also to the core of a composite panel? Yes, that, that, that would be included as, as part of the, the, the cladding, yes. Uh, and, and what if it was a timber exterior panel? If it wasn't limited combustibility above 18 metres, it couldn't be used. Uh, right. And had you come across timber that was material of limited combustibility? No. No. What about HPL, high-pressure laminate? Same? My understanding is that... HPL is not of limited combustibility, although there are different grades of the material, but I don't think any of them achieve limited combustibility. Right. And then finally, just back on, on the slides, uh, you, we've looked at uh, the first bullet point. Did you continue, looking at the right-hand side, slide four, did you continue to advise your members to follow diagram 40 and 12.6 and accept class B panels, or did you tell them, in fact, now they have to be class A1 or A2? materials of limited combustibility. We would have said there would have to be materials of limited combustibility. Now let's move on in the year to December 2014. I'd like to explore with you some meeting minutes from a meeting that you had with NHBC on the 3rd of December 2014. NHB 402862, please. Uh, now, we can see um, it's an email, in fact, from Dave White uh, to, da to Graham Perrier, Steve Evans, and John Lewis. So it's internal to NHBC, uh, dated the 5th of December 2014. But if we scroll down, please, to item two, you can see meeting with CWCT, 3rd December 2014. Present for CWCT was you, Alan Keeler, and Stephen Ledbetter, and for NHBC, Graham Perrier and Dave White. Uh, you're described as CEO of CWCT. Do you, do you know why that might be? No, that's not correct. 
Right. Um, if we go to the second bullet point down, just at the foot of the page, it says this. However, the opportunity was taken by both CWCT and NHBC to explore the current issues with, with the use of phenolic foam insulation in cavities of buildings over 18 metres. CWCT are fully aware of the issues, but from general discussion were not able to take immediate action by way of published guidance. However, they've set up a technical committee to consider aspects of fire performance and building envelope design. The first task from the initial CWCT fire design committee was to produce a route map that outlined key issues relating to current regulations, standards, and key compliance requirements for fire performance. This has not yet, <coughs> this has not yet been done, and it will be necessary for CWCT committees to meet again for further discussions involving both their principal technical committee and the subcommittee set up specifically for, for fire prevention stroke performance design issues. NHBC are represented on this subcommittee via Dave White. The meeting concluded with NHBC agreeing to keep CWCT up to date with any progress made concerning our decisions affecting fire performance and building envelopes. Now, why were you not able to take immediate action by way of published guidance? as you can see in the third line from the top there. We were still still waiting for this FAQ. We felt that was really important. And when was the technical committee set up? Uh, the technical I... committee has been around as long as CWCT has been around, as, as far as I know. Well, if we just put, sorry, we sh I shouldn't be showing you the first page. If we go to the foot of the first page, in the third line, it says, however, they have set up a technical committee to consider aspects of fire performance in building envelope design. Do you see that just above the box? Yes. Um, when was that committee set up? I assume that is referring to the, the fire group that first met on the 2nd of July 2014. I see. And it's, <coughs> is it right that its aim was to draft compliance guidance for fire safety? It's... As, as, as we discussed before, the aim of that first meeting was to better understand the issues that people were, were facing in terms of materials and cavity barriers and, and fire stops and so on. The conclusion of that first meeting was that further guidance should be published, it, probably in the, in the form of a, of a technical note, as, as we do quite frequently. And what was happening at this time? Uh, in re uh, towards that end, towards publishing further guidance. We were still waiting for this FAQ to be written. And this is now December 2014? Yes. So this is five months on from the first suggestion, almost exactly five months, yes? Yes. So this is not weeks, but a number of months. What was the feeling within CWCT about why it was that government was not producing this apparently simple FAQ and putting it on its website? It was frustrating. Um, and we, I don't know. It, it was frustrating that it was taking so long. We, at, at this, this time of the year, or that time of the year, we have an awful lot of, of teaching commitments and they were taking priority, I suppose, at, at that particular point in time. Uh, now, did you, at this point in time, which is now, as you can see, end of 2014, give any thought to chasing Sarah Colwell up, given her apparent, or so you believe, connections with government and, and asking her to take this forward as a matter of urgency, given that five months have now elapsed? At that point, I didn't, as I'm sure we'll come to, I did that in, in March of 15. But Yes, we will come to that next, but before we do, have you had an explanation for why you didn't take that forward yourself with her at that time? No, uh, other, than, other than we were focusing on, on our other activities at that, that particular point. Let's go to that. CWCT uh, 5040, please. This is an email chain between you and Sarah Colwell in March 2015, as you've just referred to. And if we go to the foot of page one, we can see at the very foot of page one, um, there is uh, the, the, the very beginnings of an email from you of the 13th of March 2015. And over to page two, we can see the rest of it. It's to Sarah Colwell, the subject is fire and facades, and the text says this. 
Dear Sarah, around September last year, Alan Keeler met with you and a couple of your colleagues to discuss some points that arose from our meeting in July, in particular the issue around the use of combustible materials in the facade and the wording of Clause 12.7 of ADB. It was my understanding that you agreed to draft a note clarifying the intent of this clause, which was to be sent to us for discussion. Has any progress been made on this? I have a CWCT board and technical committee meeting on 25th of March where I have to report on our activities, so I would be grateful for a quick response. And if we go up the next email in the chain, we can see a brief response from Sarah Colwell the same day, 13th of March 2015. And she says, hi, David. A yes, a note has been drafted and revisited. It's still a draft. Hopefully it'll be closed out soon. And then if we look a little bit further up the page, please, to the top of page one, uh, we can see you respond the same day. Later that day, hi, Sarah, thanks for getting back to me. It was my understanding that we would have the opportunity to comment on the draft. Uh, is that still your intention? We are still receiving numerous inquiries from our members on the subject, so it would be useful to see what is being proposed so we can give the correct advice. <coughs> and she finishes off at the top of the page, same day, an hour or so later, saying, hi, David, yes, we will circulate. Now, what was the nature of the numerous inquiries that you were receiving from your members that you refer to there? I can't give you any, any specifics, I'm afraid. Were they, were they on the matter of the meaning and scope of 12.7? I, I would assume so, yes. Right. When you say numerous, can you give us an approximation, an idea of how many? I, I can't, I'm afraid. I, I could have been exaggerating to try and make a point. I, right. I, don't, I really don't know. I have, I have no specific examples I can give. Sarah Colwell, as we see, responds by saying, hi, David, yes, we will circulate. But it's correct, isn't it, that you never, in fact, ever received any draft from her? That was the last contact I had from Sarah, despite repeatedly chasing her later in the year. In, in, indeed. And, in fact, as you say in your statement, and you've exhibited the emails, page 14, paragraph 48, I don't think we need to go to them, just confirm for us, please. You chased Sarah Colwell on this point, no fewer than on five occasions, 18th of August 2015, 14th of October 2015, 2nd of November 2015, and, I, and then uh, uh, one of her colleagues, I think, on the 10th of November 2015. Does that sound right to you? Yes, I, and I, I, also I also phoned and left a couple of voicemails and, and didn't get any response. In, indeed. And your email to Dandy Mackay, as we've seen, refers Sandy Mackay. Should be. Right. Uh, so, despite all that chasing throughout 2015, is it right that you never received any further response from Sarah Colwell? Yes. Did you ever find out what happened to the note that had been drafted and why it wasn't sent to you? No. Now, this is now a period of time between early July 2014 and November, early November 2015. During that period, and certainly after October 2014 and the slide presentation we saw earlier, what advice were you giving to CWCT members about the scope of paragraph 12.7 of ADB? We were telling people that 12 points, the intention of 12.7, or rather we, we had been told that the intention of 12.7 was that it applied to all materials in the, in the external cladding system, and, and that's what people should, um, should take into account. And what were you telling them about uh, Diagram 40 of Approved Document B, and specifically the reference there to Class 0 or Euro Class B? If, if we were asked about that, we would agree that there was an apparent contradiction and just say, ignore that and, and use materials that are of limited combustibility. And what about the use of aluminium composite panels with a PE core, the standard, as you've referred to it? They wouldn't be limited combustibility, so they wouldn't be appropriate for use on a building with a story 18 metres more above ground level. So is it your evidence that f f from and after, in and from October 2014, CWCT's position was that ACM panels with a PE core should not be used above 18 metres? Yes, uh, as highlighted in, in Alan Keeler's presentation, that was available to our members via our website f from October or November of 2014. 
Right. W were you basing that only on the presentation document, or was there a, a, a as, if I can put it this way, a clearer message to the effect that ACM with a PE core should not be used above 18 metres? It was only in that presentation. Okay. We were still waiting for confirmation from via this FAQ before producing any clearer guidance. Did there come a time in, that, in those long months from, let's take October 2014 to <clears> November <throat> 2015, that you began to think to yourself, I'm not going to get anything. We should now go firm on this and, and make a public statement about the use of ACM with PE core above 18 metres? We, yeah, it, it became clear towards the end of 15 that we, we weren't going to get a response and hence why we continued working on, on the, the, the roadmap, as, as we called it, and then we convened another meeting of our fire group in early 2016 to discuss that uh, and hopefully get that signed off. Yes, we'll come to that shortly. Uh, in, in your... Uh, statement you refer to a meeting of the CWCT technical group in July 2015. Let's just go to that. It's CWCT 5023. You see the first page of that there. Long list of those present, as you can see, uh, including you, Alan Keeler, uh, and others. Uh, no Brian Martin, not, not, not presumably invited. Why was that? Why not think to invite Brian Martin? You'd invited him to the 2nd of July 2014 meeting. Why not invite him to this meeting? This was a, a, a general meeting of our technical committee rather than a, a, a smaller working group on a, on a particular topic. If we go to page three, you can see on page three there's a heading, Use of Combustible Insulation. And it says CWCT is still awaiting developments from BRE on clarification of the requirements from approved document B in relation to the use of combustible materials in the walls of tall buildings. Why were you waiting for the BRE for clarification and not MHCLG? As explained, Sarah Colwell from BRE agreed to write that FAQ and uh, uh, get approval from, from Brian Martin at, at MHCLG. Right, so that, that was the status quo reflected in the emails from March that we'd seen. Yes. Um, given that she promised this document in March, but nothing had happened, and here we are in July 2015, did you think about now going to Brian Martin, sending him an email, picking up the phone, and asking him what's going on? I didn't. Why is that? I don't. I have no idea. Now, by this time, I think you were aware of the news relating to a fire which had happened in in Melbourne, uh, the La Crosse building, 24th of November 2014. Yes. Yes. So you were aware at that point that uh, here was a fire in a residential block which had spread via the external cladding, which was an ACMP cord material? Yes. Yes. Um, how much did you know about that fire by this time? This is now mid-2015. Uh, mid I don't know. At that point, I, it's very difficult to say what I knew about that particular fire. I, yeah. I, I, do you, no. Do you remember any particular discussion about this fire at this meeting? I don't remember any specific discussion, no. no. Given the position, as you'd understood it at the time, that industry had not, at least, before July 2014, considered that 12.7 uh, extended to the external panels, did the, the La Crosse fire raise any further concerns for you? It was another example of, of the dangers. If we go to the next meeting, please, this is 11th November 2015, CWCT 5039. Uh, page one, another long list of attendees. Page three, use of combustible insulation. So it looks like a standing item. CWCT is still awaiting developments from BRE on clarification of the requirements of approved document B in relation to the use of combustible materials in the walls of tall buildings. Now that, that's exactly the same sentence as we saw in the July version, isn't it? Yes? Yes. Yes. And then it adds this. However, Building Control Alliance Guidance Note 18 provides clarification 
The version of this note that is currently available on the BCA website dated June 2014 refers specifically to residential buildings, but there is a more recent version dated June 2015 which is not limited to residential buildings. Now, it looks as, as if a sentence has been added to the minute uh, um, to make reference now to BCA's technical guidance note 18 in its um, second edition, issue one. Yes? Yes. Um, would you know why that was added then, November 2015, and not, in, not to the July meeting note, given that that uh, update to that technical guidance note had happened in June 2015? I assume we didn't discuss the BCA technical guidance note in our June meeting, but must have done um, at this meeting. Right. I mean, do you know why there's no reference until this time to, to the Building Control Alliance Guidance Note 18, either in its June 14 or June 15 versions, given that option one in that note uh, stated in terms that all elements of the external wall build-up, including external facings, had to be material of limited combustibility. We made reference to BCA guidance note 18 in our teaching material fro from 2015 onwards, um, when, when we became essentially when we became aware yeah. of it. Yes, yeah, so I just I just wanted to know why th those documents those two issues of that document only make an appearance in your CWCT um, notes at this point? Well, the, these are notes of our, of our technical committee, um, and we obviously didn't, didn't discuss that document right. with our technical committee. Was your technical committee nonetheless aware of those documents? I assume they would have been. Why? Why do you make that assumption, given that there's no reference to those documents until now? November 2015. We may, I don't know, we, we, we probably mentioned them in passing when giving an update on the work on fire that we, we had done previously. It wasn't minuted as, as we saw previously, but we, we may have discussed it, I don't, I don't know. Who, deci who at the CWCT decided that Technical Guidance Note 18 provided clarification, as, it, as it's put? Well, that, that was our view. It, 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 technical, note, technical guidance note 18, option one, said all significant materials should be of limited combustibility. Yeah. And, and we felt that whilst it was frustrating that it was taking so long for us to get clarification on the, the true intent of clause 12.7, if you like, the, the pressure was slightly removed because there was already freely available guidance that had been published in 2014 by the, the BCA. Yes. I mean, in, if this was clarification, can you explain why it only came now, or you were only discussing it now in November 2015, so long after its original publication in June 2014? As I said, the, the, this, the, these are minutes from a, a particular technical committee meeting. We, I know we did discuss technical um, BCA technical guidance note 18 in, in teaching material that we provided and, and gave to industry b before this time. So we, we were you know, getting that message out. Now, if we go to page 15 of your statement, please, paragraph 52. You, you say there uh, uh, that TGA 18 provided clarification and you say, in the absence of clarification from BRE stroke MHCLG, I agreed with this statement. Uh, how, how did Technical Guidance Note 18 provide clarification on the topic of composite products, including ACMPE panels? Because it said all significant materials in the facade system or the external wall should be of limited combustibility if you're following the prescriptive route to compliance. So do we take it from that that you read and indeed, your colleagues at CWCT read option one as including the core <coughs> of a composite panel. It includes the whole panel, yeah. whether it's got a core or not. Can I just ask this? Um, <clears throat> when you talk about uh, clarification, I assume what you had in mind was some 
some sort of authoritative statement to clarify the position. Yes. BCA would not be authoritative any more than you would, would it? We weren't involved at all in the drafting or any of the discussions around BCA Technical Guidance Note 18, so we had no idea what, what information they had, what discussions they'd had with other people, whether somebody had, had clarified the intention of Clause 12.7 to them, we, we didn't know. Well, you just had the BCA Guidance Note. Yes, but we, we don't know it, what, what it, went it on behind it. No, no, but you had no reason to think that it had the imprimatur of uh, the, the government. No. So to say that it provided clarification perhaps is putting it a bit too high. What it provided was a, another view to the same effect. Yes, maybe yeah, com confirmation of, of the view that was given to us in our, in our 2014 meeting. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, and given that fact, as the chairman has, uh, and, and you have just established or discussed, was it not now crystal clear to you that there was an urgent need to get clear guidance from government to clarify ADB so that these two views, one the, the Colwell view, two the BCA view, um, could have the imprimatur of government rather than letting controversy and speculation linger? Yes, and, and that's, that's why we wanted this FAQ to be written, and I know I keep coming back to this, but we felt that was really important because that would give the official clarification that we were after. Mm. Now, you tell us at paragraph 23 of your statement on page 6, just, just to be clear, and I, I think you've really given us the answer to this before, but just pin it down in your statement. Page 6, paragraph 23, you say that... Uh, the CWCT ran a series of courses in 2015 and 2016, and fire performance was discussed. Uh, what advice during those courses were you giving your students about whether external wall panels, which were Class B or Class 0, met the requirements of approved document B? Sorry, are we, are we referring to, to paragraph 23 of my statement? Yes. This is referring to, to courses that we ran for, for NHBC yes. specifically, rather than our, our general industry courses. <laughs> You're quite right. I'm sorry. I should have made that qualification. But you're, yes. In those courses, what were you telling NHBC students about uh, Class B and Class Nought? The same thing as Alan Keeler included in, I think it was slide 14, of, of the presentation that he gave to our AGM in 2014, that the our understanding of the, the intention of clause 12.7 was that it included all materials in the, all significant materials in the cladding system. So to be crystal clear, were you telling your NHBC students during those courses that ACM panels with a, with a PE core, 100% PE core, sold as standard, were not permitted to be used in buildings above 18 metres? Yes. You were? Yes. Did you have any reason to think at the time that your students either did not understand what you were telling them or did not accept it? I had no reason to, to believe that. In terms of these particular courses, these were courses that, that NHBC asked us to run for them. There were a handful of people, my understanding, um, each time we ran the course. So it was to their sort of their senior surveyors, I think. Right. Um, and did you ever get the impression that their senior surveyors did not understand what you were teaching them? I think it was, it was very clear. The intention of Clause 12.7 is to include all, materials, all significant materials in the cladding system, and there would have been a, a discussion around that. And I don't know, but I can be fairly certain that, that ACM would, would have been mentioned. So does it come to this, that even without the FAQ... That, that had been long promised, you were content to teach your students that an ACM panel with a 100% PE core couldn't be used above 18 metres? That, that, that was the message that we, we were putting out in events and meetings and courses from the October 2014 AGM, yes. Or did you tell your students that that was the CWCT view, but there was a tenable contrary view? Sorry, can you rephrase that, please? Well, did you teach your students that... Did you teach your student, your NHBC students, 
the ACM with a 100% PE core couldn't be used above 18 metres, or did you tell them there was an argument to that effect, but an argument the other way as well, and it was all very controversial, and you were waiting for government? I suspect in delivering the the information around this topic, because it, it was a, a it was a controversial topic at the time, there would have been discussion about the the, the potential contradictions in, in approved document B, but the message would have been clear. Our understanding of the intention of that clause was that it included all significant materials in the cladding system, and that would include PE cord, ACM. Now, let's look at the email run that you had with Nick Jenkins in the early part of 2016. Um, do you remember this correspondence? It came after a ciderized correspondence uh, yes. conference on the 13th of January 2016. Yes. I think you were at the conference. I, I was. You were. Uh, uh, now, I, had you spoken to Nick Jenkins on this topic before he made his comments at the conference? I don't know if I'd spoken to him before then or after then. I'd certainly had conversations with Nick about the intent, the, the yes. meaning of clause 12.7. Yes. Now, we've, the, the inquiry has seen the video uh, and the transcript of the, um, uh, of the interaction, the question and answer session at the conference on that day. Do you remember Nick Jenkins asking a question in the Q&A session about ACM panels and their use on high-rise buildings? I do, yes. You do. Did, did you speak to him at the conference or after the conference about that? I probably spoke to him on the day. Um, but I, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Well, with six days later, he writes to you. Uh, let's look at it. BLM 50836, page two, please. His email to you of that date, 19th January 2016. Now, on this version of the email run, the, uh, the email addresses aren't there, but... Um, it, 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 halfway down the screen, it starts. Nick Jenkins wrote, Good afternoon, Steve and David. And can you confirm that the David there is you? It continues, I hope this finds you well. You may recall we met last week at the Siderize Straight BRE Facades Conference. I assume it's me. <laughs> I, I, I had correspondence with, with Nick Jenkins, I've, I've spoken to Nick. Um, it, as you said, it doesn't have an email address, so I can't yeah. confirm 100%, but, yeah, I certainly had no, correspondence uh, with Nick. No. I mean, it, it, it's a very slightly flimsy question in the because we know you respond to this email. Oh, I, in that case, yes, it was but, me. Uh, but just to confirm that. Now, um, if, it, it, it's a long email, uh, and uh, I'm not sure I want to read it all out to you. The, the inquiry has already been shown it at some length, but it extends over pages two and three. Um, and I'll read you the first paragraph. You may recall we met at the, last week at the Ciderize BRE Facades Conference. Steve, after your presentation, I asked some questions of the panel relating to the permissible use of rain screen cladding panels formed from various grades of ACM, aluminium composite panel materials, when used as part of multi-layered wall systems. There was some ambiguity in the answers provided by the panel. And then he goes on and uh, explains what the ambiguity is. And then at the foot of the page, page two, says, in my understanding, compliance is not achieved via if if either one or two are satisfied scenario, rather only via an if one and two are both satisfied scenario. If my understanding is correct and the three millimeter thick core associated with four millimeter ACM <coughs> is to be considered a filler material, then the only ACMs on the market that meet the ADB2 definition of mater being materials of limited combustibility are Alpolic A2 and Aluka Bond A2. Both of these products are classified as A2S1D0 in accordance with BSEN 13501-2007. And then he goes on to give uh, his experience uh, uh, and uh, then says in the penultimate paragraph, in many instances, uh, it is not even the BSA, uh, BS1D naught rated ACM panels we are asked to supply, but the standard polyethylene core material ACM that burns quite efficiently. What's more, I'm aware that of many tall residential buildings recently constructed in the UK where such panels are installed in combination with various foil-faced rigid foam thermal insulation boards, which are also not accepted by as being of limited combustibility in accordance with Table A7, Appendix A of ADB2. And then they say so they want to put out a guidance note. Now, I've scampered through that at some speed, um, just to refresh your memory of, of it. Um, your response to him can be seen on page one, above it, please. If we go back to that, uh, next day, 20th of January, 2016. 
and you say, hi, Nick, I agree that the current situation is unclear and unhelpful. Uh, I think your interpretation of the building regs is in relation to the use of combustible materials in high-rise buildings is correct to meet the requirements 12.6 to 12.9 and diagram 40 need to be followed. And then you say this, the question still remains as to which materials stroke components have to meet the requirements of paragraph 12.7. Previously, 12.7 was interpreted to mean simply that insulation had to be of limited combustibility, although this was not always adhered to. From recent meetings and discussions that we've had, our understanding is now that the scope of 12.7 extends to also include the external cladding. The BCA guidance agrees with this. I think this is a logical especially following the recent evidence of fire spread up the facade of a number of buildings in the Middle East with combustible cladding panels. A simple read through the approved document, however, would not tell you this. We've asked BRE to clarify the position. However, after initially agreeing, they have not come forward with anything. It was very interesting to hear your comments stroke questions regarding your experience of the use of ACM panels over recent years. In light of what the approved document actually says, I do not think that the use of combustible ACM panels in previous projects is unexpected, given the ambiguity of the paragraph 12.7 and the accepted practice at the time. Given that the BCA have now published a guidance document that presumably all building control officers will follow, the use of ACM panels of limited combustibility should become accepted best practice in the absence of test evidence straight fire engineering. In terms of the requirement for class naught, this will generally be met when using a product of limited combustibility. It should be noted that the paint finish will likely not be of limited combustibility, however can be class naught, and manufacturers should have test evidence to demonstrate this. Uh, I, I hope this is useful. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to ask. When you've written your guidance note, I'd be happy to take a look at it if that would be helpful. Now, a number of questions arise from that, and which is why I read it to you in full. First, when had you come to the conclusion that external wall panels had to satisfy both 12.6 and diagram 40 and 12.7 of ADP? That is what, <coughs> excuse me, that is what is written in, in the approved document. Paragraph 12.5 says, it give, gives a general introduction and then effectively says, no, to mitigate the risks identified, follow the guidance in 12.6 to, to 12.8 or 12.9 or test in accordance with BS8414. Because oh, I thought you'd told us earlier that, that certainly after October 2014, the view was within CWCT that all significant elements of the external wall build-up had to be materials of limited combustibility. Yes? Yes. Including the external wall panels? Yes? Yes. Yes. So, so how could you be... Uh, how could you be... Or how could the requirement be to satisfy both, given that there is an inconsistency between them, as you've accepted? Well, I, th I think I make that... I think I say something similar in, the, in this response. Oh, um, I see. So are you saying here that actually you satisfy both by being a material of limited combustibility? Yeah, and, and, and also that the, the, I think on, on the previous page it, it, it talks about having to meet the requirements and then highlights the, the issue and the, and the ambiguity around clause, uh, around clause 12.7. What would happen, what would you say uh, to somebody who came along with Diagram 40 uh, and a Class B panel and said, well, it says Class B in Diagram 40, here is a Class B panel, why can't I use it? At, at this stage, we would say our understanding is that Clause 12.7 requires the cladding as well as the insulation and other significant materials to be limited combustibility and therefore ignore 12. Point, uh, you, you, you meet the requirements, of, you, you exceed the requirements of, of Diagram 40 by having a limited combustibility panel. Uh, if you go back to page one, you start the third paragraph on, of your email to him saying the question still remains. You see that? Yes. Um, wh why was there still a question, given the advice you were at this point giving to your members and indeed had been giving since October 2014? The question still remained because we still hadn't received clarification via this FAQ. Despite, as we saw the email correspondence earlier, in March of 2015, we're told that a, an FAQ has been drafted and is nearly ready for, for circulation and for comment. So we assumed that 
was happening and then it, it didn't. And then we question why that is. What, what is, if, if the intention can't be simply clarified by an FAQ, if that's not forthcoming, what, what's the issue here? Right. Now, looking at the third line in that paragraph, you say, from recent meetings and discussions that we've had, our understanding is now that the scope of 12.7 extends to also include the external cladding. What were the uh, recent meetings and discussions you were referring to there? I assume by that I am referring to the, the July 2014 meeting and discussions from, from that point onwards. I see. Now, um, the inquiry has seen the footage of Nick Jenkins asking questions at this conference uh, and his evident concern, uh, given that he worked for a manufacturer that was supplying these panels. Uh, and you say in your response to him that you didn't think that the use of combustible ACM panels in previous projects was unexpected, given the ambiguity of 12.7 and the accepted practice at the time. When you say the accepted practice at the time, what do you mean? I think by that I mean the... Let me just help you to, churn, to turn the page because you've got the full context. I'm sorry. Second paragraph on page two. You can see at the end of that there. That's where you refer to the ambiguity of paragraph 12.7 and the accepted practice at the time. By accepted practice, I mean the, the accepted interpretation of clause 12.7 that 12.7 applied to, to the insulation. It didn't apply to the cladding. Was it your view that the use of combustible ACM panels with PE core <coughs> over 18 metres was due to the confusion caused by the ambiguity in the, the guidance as you saw it? Yes. Yes. Were you surprised to learn that Booth Murray, a, a manufacturer, wanted to provide guidance to, to industry? I, I wouldn't say I was surprised. Um, I was pleased that they were wanting to, to provide guidance and having, having spoken to Nick before... Um, no, I, I was aware that he wanted to do that. Now, if we go to page one and look at the second email down, we can see that Nick Jenkins responds to you the same day, 20th of January 2016, uh, saying, thank you for your prompt feedback, much appreciated. I'd like to put my questions directly to the BRE. Could you please advise to whom I, who I should direct this and also provide their contact details? Uh, and you then go back to him with Sarah Colwell's email address suggesting you contact, he contact her and you say, if you manage to find out any information from her, I'd be grateful if you could let me know. Um, can you tell us, why didn't you suggest to him that he should also put the question directly to Brian Martin? It obviously didn't occur to me. He, he asked for the con uh, contact detail of someone at BRE right. and, and that's what I provided. Right. Does this reflect the fact that in your mind this was really Sarah Colwell leading this and the person with responsibility for this rather than government I don't know I don't know if I would I would agree with that um, it, as we've discussed already it, it was Sarah Carwell who, who offered this view to us regarding the intention of, of 12.7 we assumed that she knew what she was talking about and and had been involved in in discussions that that led to that that view and therefore she seemed an appropriate person to talk to. Now, if we go, I mean, it's obvious, I think, at this point that you still hadn't had any feedback from, from Sarah Colwell. H had you given up chasing her by this point? Uh, yes, I had. And Your last as, as chaser was November 2015, and here you have nothing. It's now mid-2016, you've got industry expressing concerns at a major conference. Yes, I, I think the, the last time I tried to chase... Uh, say, try, Chase Sarah Carwell was prior to our technical committee meeting in November of 2015. I think at that meeting we decided that we were going to give up and just carry on and produce a draft guidance note, which we would then right. discuss with our fire committee. Right. Now, let's, um, let's look across and see what uh, Nick Jenkins does. You sent this email to him at 13.10 on the 20th of January 2016, yes? Yes. Right. Now, let's go to BLM 6067 because we there see what Nick, and Nick Jenkins does about 50 minutes later. Here is his email to Sarah Colwell. Second email down. I'm so sorry. Uh, page uh, six we want, actually. Page six. 
uh, and second email down on that page, 1348. This is his email to Sarah Colwell. Uh, and uh, the first paragraph introduces himself. And the second paragraph onwards is essentially the same as he wrote to you and Steve Evans, but with some of your comments added. Now, running it through, he doesn't receive a response. If we go up to the next email in the chain at the bottom of page five, you can see that he writes to her again on the 1st of February to, at 1342. And uh, if you look at the second paragraph, he says there, I've received feedback from Steve Evans of the NHBC BCA and also David Metcalf of CWCT, who have both confirmed that they think my interpretation of the building regs in relation to the use of combustible materials in high-rise buildings is correct, i.e. to meet the requirements, paragraphs 12.6 to 12.9 and diagram 40 need to be followed. And then over the page, the question still remains, however. And he continues in that vein, and then he says, the BCA guidance agrees with this. And then he says this, David's thoughts are that this is logical, especially following the recent evidence of fire spread up the facade of a number of buildings in the Middle East with combustible cladding panels. A simple read through the approved document, however, would not tell you this. We are awaiting feedback and confirmation from the BRE, as this is a perquisite, I think he means prerequisite, to us issuing straight publishing any much needed guidance Nate, to the industry. Now, the feedback that he refers to there is your email of the 20th of January, isn't it, essentially? There's nowhere else it could have come from. Yes. Y yes. Did you also discuss these issues at the time with Steve Evans of NHBC? Not that I recall. Now, we've seen that even after the CWCT meeting in July 2014, you were not convinced that 12.7 was intended to exclude the external cladding of, of a facade because we saw the carrier correspondence, where you said it was the current view was not that, didn't, don't we? Yes. Yes. Uh, but we see here uh, in your response to Nick Jenkins on the 20th of January and how this is reflected in his message to Sarah Colwell that you now thought it was logical that 12.7 should extend to, to, to the external cladding. Does that change? Um, is that change what you told us earlier, reflected by the change in view in the autumn of 2014, reflected by the slideshow we looked at? Yes. Right. Now, Nick Jenkins says that Steve Evans confirmed his view. Do you recall Steve Evans' response to Nick Jenkins in the Q&A? I have... I looked at... I've, I've followed some of Steve Evans' um, evidence before Christmas and... and I saw some of, some of his, his responses, yes. Yes, I, and we can go to it. it we, there's particularly the transcript, which we can look at, but let's see if we can take it more shortly. Do you remember, or perhaps having seen that material, have your re recollection refreshed by his statement to the, um, to the conference that there was an anomaly in the building regulations? Yes, I, 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 I seem to recall that yes. a particularly clear answer wasn't given. No, indeed. But that's a matter of comment, I suppose. But did, did, my question is, as a matter of fact, did you discuss with Steve Evans his own view about that anomaly and how it could be cured? Not directly, I don't think. I, th I think in, in, in relation to fire, the only sort of contact I've had with Steve Evans is in, in emails such as this where we, we've both been copied in. Right. Now, let's mo moving forward swiftly, um, d if we go up the email chain, I'll summarise this to you. Uh, Nick Jenkins chases Sarah Colwell, top of page five, and then she replies, bottom of page four, uh, on the 9th of February 2016, apologising for missing his correspondence and saying she'll come back to him. She then responds on the 12th of February 2016, middle of page four, dear Nick, you see that? Yes. We've now had a chance to look at your email, and I would suggest that you contact Brian Martin at DCLG with regard to this request, as they are the body with responsibility for this document, and therefore any interpretations associated with it. The response from Brian Martin is on page three in the middle, 16th of February, 2016, at 1709. You see it there. Yes. And I'm just going to tell you that at page one, you were forwarded this whole, forwarded this whole email string two days later, 16th. Sorry, 18th of February 2016 by Nick Jenkins. Let's look at Brian Martin's message, and I'm going to ask you about it. Hi, Nick. 
he says. It's for the designer and the building control body to consider if requirement B4 has been met. ADB gives guidance on this by saying that the external walls should not provide a medium for fire spread in tall buildings. He then offers two approaches, a set of rules or a full-scale test. In the rules, we deliberately added the word filler to address things that form part of the cladding system that are not insulation but could provide a medium for fire spread. I think the core of an ACM panel could reasonably be considered to be a filler. So unless the core material meets the rules, then the AD suggests a full-scale test. However, if the designer and building control body choose to do something else, then that's up to them. I'm on the road at the moment, so drafting this from memory. Brian, now, if we just go to the top of page one, we see there that you were forwarded this whole email chain by Nick uh, Jenkins. Gents, please find below latest communications with the DCLG. You see that? <coughs> yes, so can we take it that you were familiar with Brian Martin's response? Yes. What did you make of it at the time? I think it add, added to the confusion. So, uh, as we've discussed at our meeting in July 2014, we are told that the intention of Clause 12.7 was to include everything. All significant materials should be of limited combustibility when following the, the prescriptive route to compliance. And then in Brian Martin's email to Nick Jenkins, he, he doesn't make reference to, to that view, he is, the view he's putting forward is that the core of an ACM sh could be considered a filler and therefore comes under 12.7 as, as being a filler material rather than the, the wider interpretation that 12.7 applies to, to all materials, including clad cladding panels, whether they have a core or not. This was the, from our point of view, this was the heart of the problem. It wasn't clear if the intention of 12.7 was to <coughs> include everything, or if the core of an ACM was considered a filler material and therefore fell into 12.7, and that's what we wanted clarifying, because you get a different answer depending on those two views. Mm. Um, when you saw the email chain, did you note the fact that Sarah Colwell simply put Nick Jenkins on to the DCLG, Brian Martin, yeah. as opposed to sending her the note she had, pro she had said was ready to be circulated? Yes. Did you think of going back to her at that stage and saying, well, hold on, where's the note? I, I didn't. I, I think by that point we'd given up trying to get any information out of her. Yeah. Uh, and, and did you think to go yourself to Brian Martin and say, well, where's this FAQ? You, you read the minute of the 2nd of July 2014 at some almost two years ago. It was 18 months ago. Where is it? I'm not entirely sure of the, the time scale, but we had another meeting of our fire group, which may already have been set up. Because I think it was I think it was March of 2016. This is mid February. Yes. So our intention would be to to take these issues to that meeting that both Sarah Colwell and Brian Martin were going to attend, and and we could try and figure it out once and for all. Yes. Just looking at Brian Martin's response, please, page three again, if we can just go back to, to that. He says uh, in the uh, pre-penultimate paragraph, I think the core of an ACM pa ACP panel could reasonably be considered to be a filler. Were you surprised at the time that he wasn't able to, to offer more definitive guidance? Yes. Now, uh, there's a response from Nick Jenkins, uh, uh, same day, page two. Hi, Brian, many thanks for your prompt response. In light of the fires that have taken hold of a number of buildings clad in ACM panels in recent years, I also think that the core of ACM panels should most definitely be considered as filler. Some ACM cores meet the rules of ADB, however, the ones commonly used in the UK at present don't. To the best of my knowledge, there have been no full-scale 8414 tests carried out to date of any wall constructions featuring any type of ACM panel. I'm aware that two manufacturers of ACM have plans to have such tests carried out. This, however, unfortunately means that no existing buildings in the UK over 18 metres tall that feature ACM panels currently meet the B4 requirements. There are many such buildings and their numbers are growing. Whilst I appreciate it's for the designer and building control body to consider if requirement B4 has been met, 
I do think the current situation is of grave concern. Surely this justifies the requirement for a less ambiguous statement of the rules. With the above in mind, do you think it would be worth setting up a meeting with the relevant bodies and experts represented to review the current pre presentation of the rules? Regards, Nick. Now, you read that because it's in the email string. Were you fully aware of the scale of the problem as Nick Jenkins outlines it there? No, I don't think we were. I, we had no knowledge of what testing had been carried out or, or hadn't been carried out. Did this bring it home to you? I think so, yeah. He, so he described the current situation as one of grave concern. When you read this message, particularly in the context and the history and the attempts of getting clarification, did you agree that the current situation was one of grave concern? Yes, I think I did. And, and I think you know, the, the Brian Martin's response to, to Nick before this show, shows the, the issues that we had. It was very difficult, practically impossible, to get anyone to clarify what was meant by Clause 12.7. Did, did that cause you to consider that there might be an urgent problem that needed to be addressed urgently? As I said, we, we had a, a meeting lined up in, right. in March, and, and our view the, was that this was, this was close enough so we, we could discuss these issues at that, that meeting in March and, and try and get the situation clarified once and for all and agree a way forward in terms of the guidance that we were going to publish. Yes. Um, Mr Chairman, I've got about seven or eight minutes of questions on this run of, of email. Well, would you rather complete them? I, I think I would, but then we'll come to the, the, the March meeting. Yes. Right. Um, if you then go up in the next email in the chain to page two, you can see Brian Martin's response the next day, 17th of February, 2016. And he says, thanks, Nick. I'm not sure the text really is all that ambiguous, given that it must cover all forms of construction. People often argue that it isn't clear when they're trying to justify doing something that's clearly wrong. I'm not entirely sure that even the ACM products that have flame retardant cores would meet the rules of thumb in AD. So it'll be interesting to see if any, any of them get through an 8414 test. But that's just my opinion. We've recently commissioned a survey of Part B users with a view to feeding into the next revision. In the first instance, it might help if you put your views into that, please. And it gives you a, a website. There's a meeting of the CWCT group to talk about cladding and fire safety. It's run by Bath University. Maybe you could ask them if you can get involved. Brenda Apted, details below, is organising things. And there we see the email address, CWCT. And just focusing on the first sentence, I'm not sure the text is really all that ambiguous. We, did that surprise you when you read it? Yes. Our view, as we've discussed, is that it, it, it was ambiguous. That was, that was the view of our meeting in, in July 2014. We stated very clearly that we wanted Clause 12.7 clarified because it, it just wasn't clear. Brian Martin would have uh, did receive the minutes of those meetings, uh, of that meeting rather, and to say that it's not ambiguous, I don't, I don't think that is correct. Now, you can see from the last paragraph that it, Brian Martin is directing industry, Bruce Murray, Nick Jenkins, back to CWCT and the CWCT's own meetings. What did you make of that? I, I don't think I've really thought of anything of it at the time. Um, as I said, th th this was all going on when we had a meeting a few weeks away, so whilst it would have been preferable for Brian Martin to give a, a, a clear uh, answer to Nick's question, I suppose this was the next best thing that we, we can all sit around the table and, and discuss it. Right. Now, if we go to page one, please, at the foot of page one, you can see that Nick Jenkins responds to this. And in the third paragraph, he says to Brian Martin, I have completed the survey and also spoken to David Metcalf of the CWCT, re-forward inclusion in the CWCT group to talk about cladding and fire safety. I've already been in discussion with David regarding this matter. I think that perhaps the most straightforward way to better communicate the rules in any amended document would be by the inclusion of some annotated illustrations of commonly used multi-layered wall constructions. 
Now, what does he mean when he says that he'd spoken to you, re-forward inclusion in the CWCT group to talk about cladding and fire safety? Can I, you help? I, I'd had various conversations with Nick. I can't be entirely sure of the timing, so whether Nick phoned me after Brian Martin's previous email to talk about the, the work that we were doing, or whether he's referring to other conversations that we'd had in terms of the, the guidance note that, that Nick was writing on behalf of Booth Murie, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. You don't recall. Uh, if, if we go to the top of page two, he also says, in the meantime, we intend to construct a guidance note Stroke statement of Booth Murray's interim position, which will err on the side of caution. It's our hope that in publishing this guidance note and diagrams, perhaps jointly with the BCA, that we can educate and provide clarity of the rules as they specifically relate to the commonly used multi layered wall build ups featuring ACM cladding panels. Were you aware before you saw this email that Booth Murray were intending to construct a guidance note or statement erring on the side of caution? I think so. Uh, had CWCT given consideration to doing the same thing? No. We wanted to... I keep saying this. We wanted to get the issues clarified before we published any guidance. And our guidance wasn't just, uh, wasn't just about um, combustibility of materials. We, all, we were also looking, looking at other issues. So it wasn't a single, it wasn't a single issue... Mm. Um, case for us, that there was other guidance to, to be provided as well. But, but given the Dubai cladding fires and given the dangers and the life safety risks that 100% PE called ACM presented and the, as you call it, the ambiguity in the wording, wasn't this a topic which called for strong guidance from CWCT and urgent as I said, we, we had a meeting lined up in, in the, a few weeks after this where we would have discussed this in the hope of actually clarifying our the, the official position and from that we could publish our guidance. That, that, was, the, that was the view we took. Now, the booth Murray guidance drafted by Mick, Nick Jenkins, uh, as hinted at here, um, came to you for comment, didn't it? Yes, I, I commented on you it. You commented on it. And in fact, I think it also went to Arup and DCLG, uh, and Kingspan, for that matter. Did you know that? I didn't know that. You didn't know that? I don't think. Right. Uh, it was published on the 10th of March, and we can look at it. It's at BLM 5024, sorry, 6024. Let's have a look at it. Uh, and it's called Booth Murray's Guide to Designing Approved Document B2 Compliant Multi-Layered Walls Featuring Rain Screen Panel Systems Formed from Aluminium Composite Material. You see that? Uh, and it, cut, cutting a long story short, it basically takes the position that um, ACM, the PE core, um, needs to be a material of limited combustibility. Or well, basically can't be used above 18 metres for that because it is never going to be a material of limited combustibility. Yes? Uh, yes. Yes, I mean, so that's the effect of option one. There are a number of options in it. Uh, and and, and the, the, the division into four options essentially reflects the BCA guidance note. Um, do you know why Nick Jenkins was able to draft and release guidance to the industry based on uh, a consultation, including government, um, before the CWCT was able to do anything? Do we know if if Booth Murray received any comments from government on on this document? Well, I, 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 I'm ask, just asking you a timing question. Uh, we know that questions were asked, or the, the views of DCLG were sought. Uh, but my question to you is, why was Nick, uh, Nick Jenkins able to get guidance out, uh, including after some consultation? before CWCT was able to? Because we, we were waiting for official confirmation of right. the, the intention of Clause 12.7. Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? Yes, I think it is. We'll have a short break now. We'll come back at 20 to 4, please. And as before, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence when they're out of the room. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat>
Thank you very much. 20 to 4, please.
Would you ask Mr Metcalf to come back in, please? Right, Mr Metcalf, all ready to carry on? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, Mr Metcalf, I want to move on now to the CWCT meeting of the 17th of March 2016. Can we go, please, to CWCT 5029? This is a minute of the meeting on that day. Uh, again, did you compile this minute? Uh, Alan Keeler would have written the minutes, probably based on, on the notes that we both took. Right. We can see who was present. There's a cast from Arup. Sarah Colwell was there. Nick Jenkins was there. Alan Keeler was there. Brian, uh, David Metcalf was there. Brian Martin was there. Was Brian Martin there for the whole meeting? Yes. Mm. Um, and there were others too, including Adrian Pargeter. Was there as well, Chris Mort, Stuart Taylor, familiar names, uh, and apologies uh, from some other f quite familiar names too. Uh, held in London, so a journey for many. Um, w was there anything specific that prompted this meeting, or was this simply the time for the next meeting of the fire group to take place? This was the time for the, the next meeting of that fire group to take place. We had given up on trying to get official clarification via an FAQ, and therefore, we took the decision to call another meeting to discuss the, the roadmap that we had produced in the hope that we could get that confirmed and published. Right. Well, I was going to ask you why there was such a long gap between the meetings, July 2014, March 2016. Was that because of the months of effort to try to get an FAQ out of government through Sarah Colwell? Yes. Um, now, we can see that she attended. Did you ask her at the meeting why she hadn't responded to your many emails and voicemails the previous year? I don't, I don't know. I, I would like to think I thought I, I would have done, but I, I don't recall doing that. Um, maybe I didn't think it was appropriate. I, I don't know. Right. Were you shy of doing so? I'm just, I'm not sure it was appropriate to, to raise that issue during the meeting. I could have raised it separately, but as I said, I think we'd given up on trying to get... Right. Uh, I, out of her. I mean, you had an opportunity outside the meeting, perhaps before or afterwards or during a break, just to collar her and ask her politely, well, have you, did you not get my five emails and two voicemails? I don't recall doing that. No, why is that? I don't know. Uh, now, we have shown you who the attendees were. If we go to point three on page one, we can see there's a heading at the foot of your screen, now in the middle of your screen, Roadmap to prescript Prescriptive Compliance. Under that heading, it says, the previous meeting of the group concluded that there was a need for a simple roadmap which summarises the measures that need to be taken for a facade to meet the prescriptive rules of approved document B. APK, that's Alan Keeler, presented a draft roadmap. It's acknowledged that it needs to be supplemented by further information. However, there is limited scope for additional information within the target of a two-page document, and either the, the document will have to be extended or reference made to supporting documents. The roadmap was generally well received, however it was agreed to provide some clarification of the terminology, also a more complete listing of standards was requested. CWCT will revise the roadmap uh, based on the comments received and later discussion. Now you address this in your statement, if we can go to that please, page 20, paragraph 69. You say this. I do not recall any individual reactions to the draft roadmap. Following the first meeting, a short roadmap was suggested as a possible publication, and this is what was presented at the second meeting. The general consensus was that whilst good, the guidance needed to be expanded to provide additional detail and to make it as clear and useful as possible, all of which CWCT agreed to undertake. CWCT TN98 included a revised roadmap with annexes re referenced from the roadmap, giving that additional guidance following updating by Alan Keeler and myself. Now, this roadmap which CWC undertook to draft was, in fact, is this right, the basis of CWCT's technical note 98? Yes, it's, it's the flowchart that is contained within TN 98. And TN 98 was published in April 2017, wasn't it? Correct. Now, we'll look at that shortly, but for now, staying with these minutes, if we go to page two, we can see towards the bottom of the page a heading, combustible, combustibility of material, in yellow highlight. It says this. 
Approved document B, clause 12.7, requires insulation and filler material in the external walls of tall buildings to be of limited combustibility. BCA Guidance Note 18 extends this requirement <coughs> to all material in the wall. It was accepted that Clause 12.7 was poorly written and open to interpretation. The title of the clause is also misleading, Insulation Materials Stroke Products, and this will be changed in the next revision of ADB. Now, just to be clear, do you remember, was there any objection or disagreement expressed at the meeting with the two propositions that are expressed in that first paragraph? Namely, that Clause 12.7 was poorly written and open to interpretation... Uh, and in the second paragraph, uh, that uh, the title was also misleading. I don't think anybody disagreed with that, and and I believe Brian Martin said that the the title would be changed in the in the revision of it, next revision of ADB. Was there any discussion of the exception in twelve point seven for cavities in masonry walls? Not that I recall. That so our, our our focus was on on rain stream. <clears throat> cladding and insulation in ventilated cavities. So I don't recall discussing um, cavity block work walls and masonry walls. Right. Was that a, a relevant consideration? It, it wasn't. It, we weren't aware of any issues there. It, it hadn't, hadn't been raised as, as something that we needed to discuss. C can I just ask this? The, the first of those uh, highlighted paragraphs um, suggest that a Clause 12.7 is limited to insulation and filler rather than um, rain screen panels, and that Guidance Note 18 extends it. Was there any discussion about that? Did people accept that was the correct position? I think so. I, I don't recall anybody having a, a, a different, different view to that. A, what we've written there is is correct. Clause 12.7 requires insulation and filler material in external walls of tall buildings to be of limited combustibility. It's the BCA note that says, actually, it's not just insulation yeah. and filler material, it's it's everything. I, I think people generally accepted that. Anyway, Mr Martin didn't say, as far as you can recall at least, uh, well, that's not quite right because it always extended to include the panels. I don't recall anything that explicit, no. All right. By using the word extends there, and we may come back to this, was, uh, to your knowledge, was the draftsman of this note intending to suggest that BCA guidance note expanded the requirement to the material, all material in the wall, or merely that it applied the requirements to all material in the wall? Or is that not a distinction that... I, that, I don't see any distinction in the two things that you said, to be honest. All right. Well, uh, let's see how we go with that, um, if, if anywhere. Um, you address this part of the meeting in your statement at page 21, paragraph 71. Let's look at that together. You say this. Brian Martin was also present uh, during this part of the meeting. It was the consensus of the group that BCA Guidance Note 18 extended, you put the word in bold, the requirement as described, I agreed with this consensus because, as noted above, BCA Technical Guidance Note 18, 18 interpreted insulation products and filler materials to apply to all materials in the external wall. This went significantly beyond the previous interpretation, which was that Clause 12.7 only principally applied to insulation materials. The group consensus was that 12.7 was poorly written, and if it intended to include all the materials, that, that the title was also misleading. I do not recall Brian Martin's exact response to this. Now, it looks from that paragraph as if <coughs> your understanding and that of the group was that the BCA guidance note did expand, extend in the sense of expand the requirement. In other words, it applied the requirement beyond the natural meaning of the language of the, of the, of the paragraph. Is that what you meant? Yes. Right. And that that was the consensus of the meeting. And, and you say, I think, that halfway down, that it went significantly beyond the previous interpretation which was that the clause 12.7 only principally applied to insulation materials. So you chose the word extended, I think, or whoever drafted the minute did, consciously, because that was the understanding of how the BCA guidance note worked. Yes. Yes. 
Now, you say, I do not recall Brian Martin's exact response to this. Um, I'd like to understand what you mean. Do you recall whether he agreed with the group consensus or disagreed with the group consensus or didn't express a view one way or the other? I think that probably there were some people who who didn't entirely agree with the view that we've put forward there. I think w what everybody did agree was that Clause 12.7 was poorly written. And if it was meant to, wh wh whether people thought it included some things or not, that, that's one point. But it, every, I think everybody agreed that it was, it was poorly written and could have been clearer, and, and that, was, that was important. Did Brian Martin express himself one way or the other about that? I think so, because in, in the minutes of the meeting, it stated that the, the title of that clause will change in the next revision of ADB, and only, only Brian Martin right. could, have, could have said that because nobody else would have any knowledge of what was potentially going to be in the next right. version of ADB. To be clear, did he say that he didn't think that 12.7 was all that ambiguous, as he had told Nick Jenkins the previous month? I, I, I don't recall exactly what right. he said. I'm sorry. At any rate, I think you would recall it if Nick Jenkins had pointed a finger at Brian Martin and said, well, this is not what you told me a month ago. I, 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 yeah. So can we take it that that did not happen? I, 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 yes. Very well. Now, who was it that told the meeting that 12.7 would be changed in the next version of ADB? I, I think that, that must have been Brian Martin. Presumably, because only he could give that assurance. Indeed. Was any indication given by him as to when that might be? No. Although he, he, he may have said that a review was underway, or they, they, we saw from, from the email to Nick Jenkins that they, a, a survey had been commissioned, a, a user's survey had been commissioned on uh, regarding ADB, so obviously work was underway, but we weren't given a, a timescale. Was there any discussion uh, about the FAQ on Clause 12.7 that had been discussed in July 27, uh, 2014, but had as yet not materialised by March 2016? I don't, I don't recall whether that was specifically discussed or not. I mean, was Brian Martin or Sarah Colwell asked about why the promised FAQ had not materialised? There was nothing minuted, so on that basis I have to say no, because I don't recall. Can, can you explain why that is, given that the FAQ was the one thing that would provide authoritative clarification to this problem, and that you had been, it was important to CWCT, and you'd been asking for it for many, many months? I can't. I, 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 I assume that it was discussed, but I don't remember specifically discussing it, and we didn't minute it. So I have to, I have to say, we didn't, we didn't do it. I, no. I, I don't know. Was there any discussion at the meeting about the consequences uh, about not having that clarification from government for so many months? We would have expressed our frustration. Well, did you? I'm, I'm sure we would have done. Did anybody provide you with an explanation or a, a pacification for your frustration, perhaps? No, not that I'm aware of. Did anybody raise any concerns about the number of existing buildings out there at the time which had ACMPE on them and the risks to public safety that that posed? Not that I recall. Did Nick Jenkins reiterate his grave concern to the meeting that he'd expressed to you and Steve Evans in the private email we saw? I, I don't remember him doing that, no. Did you? Not that I'm aware of. Why is that? I don't know. If we go back to the minutes, page uh, three, please. CWCT 50 is 29, page three. Combustibility of material. 
it says this at the top of the screen, that the term filler material was intended to be a catch-all, as it was not possible to list all the materials that should be covered by the clause. In addition, there were people arguing that certain materials used in a facade build-up, such as expanded polystyrene in some instances, were not there for their insulating properties, but to pad out the facade, and were therefore excluded from the clause. This requirement should be applied, taking into account clause 12.5 of ADB, and then there's, it, there's a quotation from that. The external envelope of a building should not provide a medium for fire spread if it's likely to be a risk to health or safety. The use of combustible materials in the cladding system and extensive use of cavities may present such a risk in tall buildings. And then it goes on. Note that this clause refers to bold, combustible materials in the cladding system rather than specifically insulation, etc. Conclusion of the discussions, dash, the cladding should not contribute to the spread of fire and that the combustibility clause is intended to include quite bold all materials in the external wall. An exception may be made for small, isolated components that would not contribute to fire spread. Now, you address this section of the minute of the meeting in your statement at page 21. And if we can look, please, at paragraph 72, you say this. My recollection is... But Brian Martin stated that filler had been included as a catch-all. In Brian Martin's explanation, the term filler was intended to cover materials some had argued were included to pad out the facade or otherwise to fill a gap, rather than for their insulating properties. An example, an example of such a filler would be can-applied expanding foam. In this context, the explanation of a filler material made some sense. Based on this explanation, of course, it did not follow that the original intention, your italics, original intention of the clause was to cover all materials. Now, did, did Brian Martin actually say that at the meeting? Did he say at the meeting the term filler was intended to cover materials some had argued were included to pad out the facade or otherwise fill a gap rather than for their insulating properties? Yes. He did? Yes. And, and he, I think, referred to a, a, a building. He did, didn't give any details, but re referred to a building where, um, as we say in the, the, the notes of uh, the, the minutes of the meeting, that um, some expanded polystyrene had been included to, quote, pad out the facade. Uh, people had argued it wasn't there for its insulating properties, therefore it wasn't an insulation material, right. therefore it didn't come under clause 12.7. Now, looking at your paragraph 72, <coughs> I'd like to know what, of, what in that is you recording or rec recollecting what Brian Martin said. Did, did he say an example of such a filler would be can-applied expanding foam? I believe so. Did he say, in that context, the explanation of a filler made, material made some sense? That, that's, that's my... That's you? Yes, that's me. I see. So, just to be clear, the, the, second, the, the first three sentences of paragraph 72 is your recollection of what he said at the meeting, yes? First three sentences, but the last yes. two sentences are your, is your understanding. Yes. Thank you. Did, did, did Brian Martin mention the particular incident which had led to the inclusion of the term filler in 12.7? Uh, he, he, I think he referred to a, a particular building, but I can't be certain of that, or whether that's something I've, I've found out since this meeting. Right. I, I, and there, you may have found out since this meeting that there was a fire in Salford in yes, indeed. 2005 at the edge. Did he refer to that by name? I don't recall right. him referring to anything by name. I'm, he referred to a... Right. a project where this has happened. Did he come across as clear to you, at least, about the meaning of the guidance in 12.7? In, in so much as the example he gave made sense that a, a filler was something to, to pad or, or fill out or fill in a, a gap within the facade, it, it didn't follow that the intention of, of that clause was to include all materials. Right. I see. So c can we take it from that, that he gave you the explanation for the origin of the introduction of the word into 12.7, uh, 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 and you thought, your reaction was that um, it, that didn't mean that 12.7 should be taken as applying to all external wall materials, including external panels. Yes, that, that, yes it's I difficult see. to reach that conclusion from, from the explanation that we were given. Yes, I see. Now, going back to the minutes, please. <coughs> um, I've read it to you already, but page three... Um, at the very top, in the second line, where there's a reference, there were people arguing that certain materials used in a facade build-up, such as expanded polystyrene in some instances, 
were not there for their insulating properties, but to pad out the facade and were therefore excluded from the clause. It sounds, it sounds from paragraph 72 in your evidence just now is that that is what Brian Martin said. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then you see underneath that, this requirement should be applied taking into account 12, clause 12.5 of ADB. Did Brian Martin say that? Yes. And then if we look at the last paragraph, the conclusions, um, uh, you say this in your statement, if we can go to page 18 at the bottom, paragraph 65, please, you say, uh, uh, in the second line, I do not think that the minutes we have are, uh, are accurate in this instance insofar as I do not think that the final paragraph of the section on combustibility of material is entirely accurate. It refers to the intention of Clause 12.7 being to apply to all materials. I think a more accurate description would be that it was concluded that 12.7 should apply to all materials. This is discussed further elsewhere in this statement. I believe Brian Martin was present for the head of this meeting. Now, to be clear, are you saying that it was decided at the meeting of the 17th of March 2016 that Clause 12.7 ought to be read as applying to all materials in the external wall, but didn't on its true reading, and that, and that for future reference it should be understood to apply in that way? Yes. Yes. As I said, the, the, the explanation given on the, the origin of, of the introduction of, of filler material clearly didn't imply that the original intention was that it should include everything. Right. Did Brian Martin say that 12.7 was always intended to include external cladding? I don't think so. Right. Did he say that 12.7 was always intended, from the word go, to have the extended or broadened application that the BCA technical guidance note had said and that Sarah Colwell had told you in July 2014? I don't recall if he explicitly said that, but even if he did, his explanation of the word filler would go against that. Right. Did he confirm that the, that the interpretation to be used for future reference, namely the 12.7 ought to apply to all materials in the external wall, was new? I, I don't... I think we were all happy with the conclusion that had, we had reached that clause 12.7 should apply to everything. I don't recall individual responses to that. Was there any discussion about all the buildings that had included combustible external panels before this new consensus? No. Can you explain why that is or might have been so? We, we were focusing on providing guidance for the industry as, as what they should be doing from that point onwards, we, it, it, this wasn't a discussion about historic uses of materials. That, that's a, a huge issue, obviously, but that, that wasn't the scope of this meeting. This was about trying to establish the guidance going forward. Yes. Now, just to finish this off, c covering a little bit of the same ground in, in the next question, but if you look, please, at your statement at page 21, at paragraph 73, you say this. Da uh, <coughs> excuse me, four lines down, doubt still remained over the original intention of the clause, especially after the explanation of the term filler given by Brian Martin. Personally, I had my doubts over the original intention of the clause. However, I was happy with the conclusion of the discussion, which was that the consensus of the meeting was that 12, clause 12.7 should apply to all materials in the external wall. I do not recall the reaction of any individual present at the meeting. However, my understanding was that this was not the widely held interpretation of the clause, and indeed, this had not been our interpretation of the clause, and then you put this in italics, as it was written. The doubt you refer to there, did that relate only to your own views, or did others at the meeting express doubt that the original intention of the term filler was to cover all materials in the external wall build-up, in including external panels? I, I, think, I think everybody had doubts as to the, the original in intention, and as we've discussed before, if 
if the intention was to include all materials, in, including the cladding, then why have, why you have a contradiction with 12.6, which doesn't make any sense. So, again, all these things, you put them together, and, and it, it doesn't appear as if the original intention was to include everything. Not least because of the reference to Class B in Diagram 40. Yes. Did anybody actually look Brian Martin in the eye and ask him that very point? I don't know. Uh, we, we, we would have questioned anything that we were told, and if, if told that 12.7 included the cladding, we would have, we would have raised the issue of, of Clause 12.6 in Diagram 40. So it's such an obvious contradiction. Does it, does it come to this, that, that you were content with the approach to be taken going, going forward for the future, that that is how 12.7 should be read, namely as applying to all elements or significant elements in the external wall build-up, including external panels, yes? Yes. But, that his, you, were, but you were sceptical of Brian Martin's histori historical explanation that that was always the intention of 12.7? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, now going slightly further down in paragraph 73, over on page 22, you say, um, in fact, I think we need the top um, of page 22, <coughs> this position also aligned with the guidance given by the Building Control Alliance. I think that Brian Martin said changes would be made in the next revision to ADB, and I think Brian Martin was happy with the conclusion reached. I certainly do not recall Brian Martin disagreeing with the decision, nor were there other objections to the conclusion, nor were there alternative suggestions. Was any indication given as to when the next revision of ADB was due? No. And what about a consultation on that next revision? Was that, was that discussed? I believe it may have been mentioned in, in passing, but I don't think any, de any particular details were given. And what gave you the impression that Brian Martin was happy with the conclusion reached at the meeting? I think we, we were all happy with the conclusion that was reached. We all... I can't say we all had, but lots of people had had concerns over Clause 12.7. There was enough evidence around to indicate that combustible cladding was a problem, and therefore I think we, we, we were happy that we reached the conclusion that we reached, that everything should be of limited combustibility to, to try and reduce that risk. If the change to ADB to explain that 12.7 was to apply to all materials in the external wall build-up, including external panels, wasn't going to be made until the next revision of ADB, then how were the members of the construction industry, who were not at this meeting, meant to be aware of the change? We would publish a, a, a technical guidance note. We, we would still have preferred it to be clarified officially, as, as I've said many right. times before, but we, w we were all happy with the conclusion that had been reached. The fact that Brian Martin was present for this part of the discussion, whereas he hadn't been present for the discussion on combustible materials in our previous meeting, gave us confidence that, gave us the confidence that we, we needed to, to go ahead with the guidance that we, we published. Yes, I mean, did, did anybody at this stage of the meeting, having reached this conclusion, or, or on the margins of it afterwards, discuss the potential life safety implications of Clause 12.7 having been so poorly drafted and misleading for so long, thereby leading the construction industry to think that if, for example, ACM panels had national class naught, then they could be used on external walls above 18 metres. I can't talk for, for anybody else, but we, that wasn't something that we were focusing on. But again, the fact that People like Brian Martin, uh, officials from DCLG were, mm. were present at this meeting. They were present to, uh, to hear the concerns that were being raised about ambiguity of, about the guidance they were, they were providing. Now, that should have made people look at these things in more detail. Mm. Well, was there a sense, and you were at the meeting, tell us, was there a sense in which the historical legacy of this poorly drafted clause was to some extent an elephant in the room? To be honest, it, it, I, I don't think it was because that, that simply wasn't what we were focusing on. We were focusing on writing guidance that could be published to, to help people from, from that point onwards. That was our focus at this point. 
No one thought to examine the elephant, or see if there was an elephant, and ask themselves the question, well, if this clause had meant to extend to all elements in the external wall build-up since 2006, there's a 10-year legacy of misunderstanding by the UK construction industry. What are the life safety implications of that? Did nobody ask themselves that question? I don't know. I don't know. You didn't? We... No. Why not? Our, as I said, our focus was about trying to provide guidance and clarity for, for the industry. That, that's our role. Let's go to CEV uh, 708, please. This is the minute CEV 708. Yes, thank you. This is a minute uh, of a CWCT board meeting that took place on the 6th of April 2016, at which you are present. Uh, and this is about three weeks after the fire group meeting of the 17th of March. If we go to page two, please, fifth paragraph down, we can see the minutes record the following. There are still concerns, do you see? There are yes. still concerns on the issue of fire, and these will be discussed at the afternoon technical group meeting. Brian Martin, DCLG, who wrote most of the government document and sits on the CWCT fire group, <clears> has indicated that there may be consultation on a revised approved document starting soon. Is that right? Had Brian Martin actually told you that there would be a consultation on the revised approved document starting soon? I have to assume that's the case because that's, that's what we've minuted here. As I said before, right. he mentioned a revision uh, at, at our meeting the previous month. I don't recall exactly what he said at that point, um, but I have no reason to doubt the, the minutes here. I see. So the word indicated, does, does that refer to the fact that what you wrote here about what he said, he said at that meeting? Yes. I see. So you didn't have a later conversation with Brian Martin no. on this subject? Right, I see. Um, let's then turn to the to Technical Note 98 of 2017, uh, which is the roadmap outlined at the 2016 meeting. Um, if we go to uh, your statement, please, at page 22, paragraph 74, there's the starting point. You say there... Um, I had no knowledge, this is halfway through the paragraph, I had no knowledge of when ADB would be revised, but as agreed during the meeting, CWCT revised the roadmap to include further detail, and this was published as CWCT TN98, Fire Performance of Facades. Are you saying that it was agreed that the CWCT, at the CWCT meeting on the 17th of March 2016, that the extension made to 12.7 to include all elements of the external wall should be disseminated to industry via CWCT guidance rather than a revised version of ADB? No, we, we had no say in any revisions to ADB. We, we, it had been agreed at that meeting what should, what clause 12.7 should apply to. We were happy with that. We were comfortable with the conclusion that had been reached and therefore it was our decision to, to publish guidance in, in the way that we do. So was the, was the decision to publish guidance a decision arrived at as a result of hearing Brian Martin at the 17th of March 2016 uh, and his non-objection, as it were, to the characterisation of 12.7 as poorly drafted and misleading? Yes. And requiring of revision? Yes. I see. So that's the change, is it? Yes. So that, that gave us the, the confidence the views being put forward were correct. We were comfortable with that. We, we felt that at this time there was enough evidence to, to, to demonstrate that all materials should be of limited combustibility and, and that's what we published in our, in our Technical Note 98. Now, the note eventually, Technical Note 98, was published in April 2017, wasn't it? It was, yes. So does that tell us that there was no clarification given to industry in the period between the discussion at the meeting on the 17th of March 2016 and uh, 13 months later? There would have been discussion during CWCT courses where fire was, uh, w was discussed and by that, by that point we would have been 
they're more, more confident about the, the information that we were providing. So it's, it's not fair to say that we didn't provide any information, but there was a delay in our technical note, yes. R right. Why was there? Why was there a delay in your technical mm. note? Mainly because of the, the feedback that we received at the meeting in March of, of 2026. The 2016. Sorry, 2016. The, the conclusion of our 2014 meeting was that the group wanted a short one or two page, simple flowchart roadmap type approach to, to highlight the issues. That's what we took to the meeting in 2016. And whilst feedback on that flowchart was very positive, people then decided, actually, no, we want more information. It's no good just saying you need to provide cavity barriers. Actually, we want a section on cavity barriers and a section on fire stopping and a section on various other things. And that all took time to, to draft and approve with the fire group and our technical committee um, in addition to the other things that we were doing at right. that time. I mean, 13 months is a long time, given the pre-existing delay that had already happened between 2014 and March 2016, isn't it? It is. I mean, looking at almost three years of delay. Yes. Um, and c c can you explain that? I, I think I've explained it already. We, we desperately wanted official approval of the, the view that was, that was given to us. And once we had that, we were happy to proceed with drafting our guidance. It turns out that more guidance was, was required. And, and when we have to approve things via working groups and technical committee, it, it all takes time, unfortunately. Okay. We, have, we have limited resources and, and other pressures on our time. And, and it took longer than we would have liked. Well, let's look at technical note 98, shall we? It's CWCT 5024, please. Uh, that's page one. It's entitled Fire Performance of Facades Guide to the Requirements of UK Buildings, Reg Building Regulations. And just above it, it's, it says it supersedes technical note 73, which was March 2011. And if we go to page 13, at the top of the page, it says this, under combustibility of materials. Limits on combustibility of materials are given in clause 12.7 of ADB. Clause 12.7 specifically refers to insulation materials and filler materials, but is now being interpreted more generally. See BCA guidance note 18. Therefore, where a building has a story 18 meters or more above ground level, all significant materials all in bold, should be of limited combustibility, class A2, in accordance with EN 13501 part one. This includes, but is not limited to, first bullet, rain screen panels. Standard ACM panels do not meet these requirements. Limited combustibility ACM panels are available. Insulation materials, the only commonly used insulation material that will satisfy the definition of limited combustibility is mineral wool. Uh, and then you go on sheathing boards and backing wall, plaster boards. These requirements apply to the full height of the wall, both above and below 18 metres, i.e. in a high-rise building. Materials below 18 metres would also have to be of limited combustibility. And is that the clarification that you had been wanting to make, um, or rather had been asking for, since 2014? Yes. Uh, and which I think you'd known since June 2013 had been desperately needed by industry. Yes? Yes, we wanted Clause 12.7 clarified. Was the CWCT ever placed under any, under any pressure from its sponsors or members not to make this clarification by way of published guidance? No. Did you take any steps at this stage to go back to the members who previously queried the acceptability of Class B or Class 0 materials over 18 metres? Um, su such as WinTech, and tell them about this new guidance and the significance of it. We would have, <clears throat> excuse me, we would have emailed all of our contacts and, and members to inform them this technical note had been published. Right. And, uh, was there an adverse reaction from the construction industry to it? Not that I recall, no. Right. And at this stage, we're now in April 2017, was, it, was there any dis consideration by CWCT, to your knowledge, of the legacy history 
of buildings in the UK which had been built over 18 metres using rain screen panels comprising standard ACM? No, that wasn't something we, we considered. Uh, or insulation, which was not material of limited combustibility? No. Not. Even at that stage, you didn't consider the legacy? We, we would have considered it. It's something we would have, have discussed internally. Um, but we weren't the people to, to, to deal with that. That's a, a building control, a government, an NHBC issue. We, we, ha we didn't approve any of those materials in any buildings. We, we had no, no input into that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Metcalf, uh, you'll be pleased to know that I've come to the end of my prepared questions. Mr. Chairman, it's just after 20 past four. Um, I would like to be able to release this witness this evening yes, rather of course. than making him stay overnight, even though he was scheduled to do so. If, if I was to ask for a break until 20, well, 25, 25 to 5, is that, would that be inconvenient? I, I think that would be very convenient. I'm sure Mr. Metcalf would like to get away, <laughs> get away this evening. Mr. Metcalf, just so that you understand what's going on, uh, you may or may not know this, but when council gets to the end of his questions, we have to have a short break to enable him to take stock and others who are... Uh, watching the proceedings from elsewhere to suggest questions that perhaps we ought to put to you. Yep. So we'll have a short break now. We'll only have 10 minutes, I'm going to say, 25 to 5. Yes. Uh, if it turns out that a little longer is required, well, so be it. and We'll see how we go. And then uh, when you come back, we'll see if there are any more questions for you. OK. All right? So, Thank you. Uh, and uh, you're not going to have a chance to talk to anyone about your evidence, but should the opportunity arise, don't take it. All right? Okay. I'd like to go to the usher, please. Okay. Right, Mr. Millick, we'll say 25 to 5, and if it turns out that you need a bit longer, you can ask the usher to come and tell us. Thank you very much, right. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much.
Would you ask Mr Metcalf to come back in, please? <coughs> Right, Mr. Metcalf. Well, I'm sorry it took a little longer to get things organised, but uh, okay. we're ready now and we'll see if there are more questions for you. Yes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm in the curious position of being promised a question by 4.40 and you coming in at 4.39. Therefore, I'm going to stand here for another 20 seconds, uh, passing the time of day with the panel, to see if the much promised question does emerge. Uh, and if it doesn't, then I'm going to um, ask you uh, to call an end to Mr. Metcalf's evidence. Uh, yes. And, uh, those behind me are waiting with bated breath for the question to arrive. And you're going to entertain us for another 30 I'm seconds? I'm not entirely eh? sure what it is that I can do, um, but uh, it is now the time given, and I'm going to... Uh, common sense, I think, and deference to the witness and the, the, the proceedings requires me, I think, to say that there are no further questions for this witness. Um, Mr Metcalf, it remains for me to thank you very much indeed for coming to the inquiry and um, assisting us with your evidence. We're extremely grateful to you. Thank you. Uh, and I have no further questions for you. Um, you've noted the screen, have you? Uh, I have. If I, uh, no, I haven't. Well, there we are. It only goes to show. Um, there is a supplemental question. I'm now going to have to... I'm sorry, Mr. Metcalf, but uh, <laughs> this can happen, I'm afraid. <laughs> I have to revoke my invitation. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, looking at the question, I, 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 it is a question which I think I have covered generically with the witness before, and therefore I don't need to ask it and to detain him any longer. Mr Chairman, I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Mr Metcalf, for your patience. Thank you. Well, Mr Metcalf, first there was a question, then there wasn't. Anyway, um, well, it's right that I should thank you very much on behalf of the uh, members of the panel as a whole for coming to give your evidence. I th think I can speak for all of us when I say we've found it very interesting and very useful. Uh, and we're very grateful to you for giving up the time to come and tell us what you know. So thank you very much. And I'm very glad we've managed to finish you today so you can now uh, uh, get away. Great. Thank, thank you very, very much. much indeed. Thank Well, thank you very much, Mr Millett. That must be it for today. And tomorrow we shall look forward to hearing another witness. Yes, Mr Chairman, uh, it is. That's it. That's it. And tomorrow morning uh, we then have Mr David Crowder of the BRE who will be examined by Ms Grange of Leading Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. 10 o'clock tomorrow morning then, please. Thank you.